Hello and welcome to my series of conversations with stalwarts of music. Today's episode is being partnered along with Perpetual Buzz Experiences, which is an artist representation company with three very basic but lofty goals. They are the launchpad for a lot of indie musicians helping them leverage success thereby pr- producing some of the most memorable experiences for music lovers. They also help generate funding for social causes and make sure people have a good time throughout the process. Be sure to check them out on www.perpetualbuzz.com. We have yet another podcast partner which is Wire Up Music Store, one of the finest music retail stores with state of art equipment. Your one-stop solution for musical gear ranging from guitars to ukulele, percussive to classical instruments. Do check them out on their Instagram handle which goes by @wireup.india. Speaking of my guest today, he is from the world of jazz music and he began his career featuring as a subject for the 1996 documentary Jewels at 8. At the age of 12, he performed at the Grammy Awards. Much later, he became a faculty member of the jazz workshop at Stanford University. He was classically trained at San Francisco Conservatory of Music and he has also learned Indian classical music at the Ali Akbar College of Music. Later he graduated from Berkeley School of Music in 2008. I'm talking about the multi Grammy nominated Julian Lark. He has played alongside legends such as Bill Frisell, Carlos Santana, Yoko Ono and many more. Not long ago There were a lot of critics saying that jazz was dead and people did not want to hear it. But then Julian and his trio came along and breathed new life into this musical form. So without any further ado, I'm delighted to welcome Man of the Hour, Julian Lark. There it is. Hello. Hi Julian. Namaste. How are you? Yeah. yeah. I'm well. How are you? Very well. Which which part of the world are you in right now? Are you in Milan? Right now? Yeah. We're in Italy. We played tonight. We've and uh, yeah, I'm very happy to to be here with you. Likewise, likewise. It's it's been an absolute pleasure to have you on my show. Yeah. So let's get started. Uh, you were considered a prodigy, and you were the primary subject for the documentary called Jewels at Eight back when you were a little boy. How did you make sure that you always stayed motivated to keep learning and exploring in spite of the pressures that were added on in terms of living up to expectations well you know what's a good question it's it's funny uh, i think it's human nature mm-hmm. uh that when we are the center of the you know attention like i was it's very hard to have perspective very yeah. hard to have perspective you know um i don't even think i interpreted uh many things as being uh pressure uh i i remember as a young person just feeling like i love music i love getting better i want to get better and and i was so lucky that i was supported by family teachers friends who all were very nurturing you know um got it and and that's what i remember as far as i think external pressures sometimes almost feel bigger to other people than mm. they do to the person in the middle and and, and looking back i think maybe i i i feel more like uh aware of wow that w- that was a lot for a young person but as the young person i just thought this is great and also you know keep in mind though i though i had it there's a lot of attention um it was before social media it was before a certain sense of being everywhere so yeah there's a documentary but that was a, that was for um the director's college project you know and then there was tv stuff but it'd be on once and never on again so um i think i benefited from being uh young in an era that was very um felt a lot lower pressure than today got it i'm sure there must have been a lot of nurturing by your parents and mentors at different levels and uh yeah. i'd like to understand how much of it was you know uh, their effort and how much of it evolved out of your own maturity of understanding these things 
It's a good question. I, I don't know if I can answer it. I don't I who knows, right? <laughs> who knows what the what the equation is, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I do think there's a um yeah, there's something sympathetic, right, between yeah. those around you and your own impulse to uh grow and get better. And and also I, I think it bears saying uh that music is wonderful. You know, music is is nurturing, music is healing, music is um it's it's a spiritual um kind of wonder of the world that's how i feel it feel it um so regardless of my progress or regardless of me even i think just to be a human near music mm-hmm. um to listen to it to play it i think is very uh uh grounding i think right. it's very uh, educational um and so I couldn't tell you where i end and the music begins or where i end and the people around me begin it, it's 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 a collective effort, isn't it? For sure. But, uh, you know, there, there must have been a lot of exploration outside the realm of music, which might have informed you a lot of interesting things as to your aesthetics. So could you throw some light on that? I, I would say, though, that's an understandable assumption. I'm not sure mm-hmm. uh, that I could speak to too much outside of the music again i i i i i grew up in a very artistic household you know and aesthetics are um of interest you know whether it be um you know visual art or interior design or literature or what have you film i mean it's it the family my family's always been full of um tremendous curiosity so yeah you could say that those elements informed and also uh, a, a, a sense of um, how would you say it? Putting the importance on personal growth, I think, mm-hmm. has always been part of uh, the environment I've grown up in. Whatever that means, self care, you know, right, exercise, right. self love, you know, things that that are um, you know, compassion, empathy, all those things are are, are vital. Um, so you could say that those inform it. Uh, the music even aesthetically but but um but but really i'm such a uh, i'm such a nerd for music you know and that's right. whether whatever the genre is and i so i think um my look at aesthetic considerations is you're kind of um well i have no idea what i take in but i know that it's my job to play something that feels authentic or write music that feels like yeah that sounds kind of like me uh, and I, and I, one of the ways to do that is to write all the stuff that really doesn't sound like me, you mm-hmm. know, mm-hmm. the amount of songs I write that are, I go, ah, it sounds like I'm trying to do this. I don't want it, you know, or, or, wow, I really missed the boat on that. Cause that's, that's actually not acknowledging this other thing that is really important to me. You know, the considerations of any writer of any discipline, um, yeah. those are always at play. So I think aesthetic almost, it just kind of, it's the results, um, but it's, you can't always, for me, in my case, I haven't always been able to uh, codify it. From what I gauge, uh, as per what you said, none of this is strategized. It's, it comes very naturally to you, and you like to keep it that way. Well, that's good. Um, I can't speak to how it seems, but I, I you know, I do love it. You know, I do love right. it and I love right. the people involved. And I think there's an incredible intelligence mm-hmm. in the community of musicians. You know, I remember being very young and, and feeling like you kind of couldn't not get better, you know, because everything you learn makes you, you know, you know, you know, one chord, you learn a second chord. You're like, oh, my God, I just doubled <laughs> my <laughs> capacity. Oh. So I, I do feel at least attracted to that form of uh, development. Yeah, very natural. Lovely. When you play, there seems to be a lot more than just the instrument. Right? You seem contemplative or, you know, say if you're having a conversation with the instrument, maybe one might even say that you're dancing with the instrument. So you've explored the Alexander technique, body mapping, mm-hmm. etc. Mm-hmm. How have they helped you in terms of your practice and performance? Wow. Well... Uh, yeah, you're absolutely right. For for me, uh, I think the word dance is absolutely appropriate. Um, I think as a as a guitar player, 
like my friend Gerald Harsher says, we, you know, you move for a living, you move. <laughs> it's about movement. Yeah. Uh, and so if it, your movements tend to intersect with the guitar, mm-hmm. causing a sound to happen, but, but it, it is, it is about the clarity of movement. Uh, and, and for me, I just happen to have an interest in bringing that to a conscious level and not everyone wants to, or needs to, you know, some people just pick up an instrument and it's there and it's, wow, it's great. Um, in my case, I, I've been curious about anatomy, um, mm-hmm. things like the Alexander technique, um, or Feldenkrais or body mapping. They, they're, they're basically, um, methods of understanding the language of movement. Um, Right. Not to say there's one correct way to move, but just to say that you're allowed to talk about movement. And here are ways you can talk about movement. Uh, that's been very advantageous or beneficial for me when it comes to uh, trying to dissect maybe a problem that I'm experiencing with the instrument. Like, uh, uh, okay, maybe I get especially tense when I play a certain tempo. Well, what, what, what are my tools to kind of investigate? And that's often when I'll look at the relationship of the the whole body, you know, not just the, what touches the guitar. So it's the movement of the head, the neck, the spine, the, everything. And also yeah. in relation to gravity and all those other things. So I, I would say it, those are um, absolutely great tools uh, for investigation. And like I said, it's not for everybody. I, I just happen to really love it. It's very interesting, you know, the the way you kind of articulated it. Uh, kind of trying to find commonality between, say, a dance form and uh, the music that you're trying to put out, right? So I see a lot of common strands in terms of both of these. Yeah. Right? The, the yeah, role of, that's, yeah. yeah. Wonderful. No, no, you, please, please go ahead. You see, please. Yeah. Uh, in terms of uh, one of my all-time favorite documentaries uh, would be Keith Jarrett's uh, Art of Improvisation. And in this particular documentary, he is asked to define the importance and relevance of things like philosophy and physics in the realm of music. I would like to know your point of view as to the same. Well, it's a great question. I, 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 I confess, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> I, I, I don't think as, um, I don't think I have as wide of a, uh, a wide enough awareness or um, to really in- incorporate mm-hmm. those things into my conception of music. And and, right. and, uh, and and though it's a fabulous question, and I think you look at Keith, who is the ultimate master, you know, mm-hmm. of improvisation and virtuosity and expression and transmission of, of yeah. like a real message. Um, and, and I believe it. I believe that his, it, you know, that he incorporates everything into that um Mm -hmm. uh it just doesn't happen to be the way i've framed it to myself at this point um but it's a great question (laughs) thank you so much for that yeah your study with other musicians uh of different instruments you you've studied with sofia rossoff gary burton Mm -hmm. bob moses Mm -hmm. how has that helped you think about the guitar and what are some of the qualities of a good teacher that you personally embody at this point Hmm. Qualities of a good teacher. That's a great question. I, I think it's a listening. I think it's a high degree of um, presence with the student and all of those people you mentioned mm-hmm. um, in their presence, you feel seen, you know, you feel like you're not fighting for their attention, that you feel like they are curious, that they're warm, that they're also willing to, um, you know, get, give you advice you know sometimes i think it takes a certain amount of courage to um say you know what i think you know is good for you is this um uh, it takes courage to do it in such a way that uh still incorporates the needs of the student you know uh in other words you know i remember sophia rosoff i went to her and one of the great teachers and she's a piano teacher you know and but she we used to talk about we we're talking about an injury I had and how to play with more fluidity. And I remember playing for her and feeling like, wow, no one's ever listened to me so closely. Like I don't even listen yeah. to myself as closely as she listened. Yeah. And then upon giving me advice, she was really saying, you know, consider 
these techniques. I invite you to try this thing out. I invite you to take note of this. And I thought, wow, that's really quite powerful, you know, and, and it's also because of her courage and, and uh, the courage of being a great teacher. I feel as though as a student, um, I don't want to ignore what they're saying, even if I don't agree with it in the long run. Um, it almost invites the student to be vulnerable, invites the student to take a risk. Uh, and I think if you leave a lesson feeling like as a student, like, wow, I can, I, I can be strong and I can jump off this cliff musically and I can go deeper than I ever thought possible. I think it's been a very effective lesson. So I think about those qualities a lot, both as a student and as a teacher. Got it. Uh, you did mention about this, uh, part where you said uh, there's this aspect of transmission right from a master mm. to the student mm. so what i see yeah. these days is we uh, a lot of people tend to sort of take virtual lessons and uh, you know right. so there is, the teacher cannot monitor or you know uh, watch you closely as to your technique yeah. and things like that so do you feel that the, the the whole process of transmission is being lost somewhere in the modern uh, aspects of uh, teaching music? It's a great, great question. And I, I think about it a lot, you know, just because teaching and frankly, the way we interact with each other has gone so much on, online and with video lessons and video mm -hmm. calls and all the, the rest yeah. of it. Um, I, I don't think it's being lost. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's being lost, but I, but I think it, it asks, at least has asked me to, uh, reconsider what a transmission is now part of it is i think of transmission probably uh in the more traditional sense of you know passing from one to another um however in teaching more and more i realize that a large degree of that transmission is about um what the student brings to the lesson in other words uh if a student if you're going to teach online and a student signs up for a lesson and they show up and they go on the screen they play their guitar for you uh before i've even said a word or any teachings happen mm -hmm. um the student has had to come to a certain um place of vulnerability and and and, and uh kind of um awakening just to show up and put themselves out there that's the courage i'm talking about uh, sometimes that experience is enough for a student to feel like they got something because you know, they had to reflect, what am I going to play? They had to be nervous. They had to go through all those stages. Yeah. Um, so I sometimes I feel like the job is done right there. And then, then the conversation begins, and hopefully that's another additional aspect of the transmission. Um, but it's the same with concerts, you know, or music. I think right. we, as you know, we often go to hear music and we, I'd like to think that the artist is giving me a, emotion but the truth is i'm projecting onto the music i nothing that's played is inherently sad or inherently wonderful or you know what i mean but if i'm in the place where i hear and i go this is my favorite song or they're amazing in a way it says everything about me the audience member it doesn't really say what anything about the artist you know what i mean um so transmission involves what we project and therefore, I'm not too concerned about it being challenged uh, in the digital age. I just think we might we might experience it differently. Fair enough. Yeah. Are you a strict teacher with your students? I wouldn't. I, you know, in some ways, yes, I would say. Okay. Uh, but 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 strict, not by any by not by the uh, by way of any methodology. You know, it's not like you must learn this or else you're out of here but it's i think the strictness is making sure that we're as honest as possible about what the, the student actually wants to mm -hmm. learn i think there's a lot of things we're told we want to learn especially right. in jazz you know um and i think that can be different than cultivating uh a, a path creatively that's really personal so yeah i, I think i'm I, that's probably where i'm the strictest uh, yeah I've been always intrigued by uh, different record labels ever since I was a little boy. I used to go uh, like Google a couple of interesting record labels like Universal, 
Capital, wow, yeah. Columbia Records, etc. Yeah. And you are now associated yeah. with Blue Note Records. Uh, in some ways, it represents an induction by the system, perhaps, in the musical mm-hmm. form that you're trying to put forth, where you're working closely with this establishment that caters to the highest aspirations of any jazz musician. Has a shift involved a feeling of compromise or surrender mm-hmm. in some ways? Mm-hmm. It's a great question. Uh, no is the answer that comes to mind. Yeah, you know, l- labels are, I'm similar to you. I, I think they, you know, uh, are fascinating in terms of what they represent in culture, you know. Right. And, and also, I think historically, when we look back at Motown or we look back at Riverside or we look back right. at, at, you know, Def Jam or any of the labels, we, we can tend to uh, see a, mer- like a story emerge about the era the culture and um so it's a very direct way into um, understanding the world of music having said that at the end of the day these labels are run by people you know artists hopefully or people who are artistically minded in the case of blue note it's led by don was who's one of my dear yeah. friends you know and um so don is a brilliant person and a brilliant musician and creative force and community leader and everything so to be with blue note is to be with dawn you know which means um uh, no sense of surrender just a sense of um celebrating what what it is that we do um and and knowing that he's got our back you know and he try he's gonna protect us and and if you look at the history of blue note what i think is so special is i get the impression that's what um the other leaders of the label have provided to you know it's a label that understands that um it's about pushing the music forward mm-hmm. and that you can combine that with the commerce of selling records um if you're aligned if you're on the same page um so so yeah i don't feel it as a pressure but i do feel, feel it as a, a, a sense of support wonderful i have a follow-up question based on whatever you said uh it's it's something this it just you know struck me and i really wanted to ask you this uh yeah. currently we are subjected to globalization of culture and technology and a lot of innovation that we see <clears throat> and we have tools and mediums of uh, you know collaborating with these distribution platforms and distributing our own music in our own yeah. inimitable style based on the time that yeah. we have but again this is like a gradual process of you know growing up or climbing up the ladder in terms of the market or what not yeah. uh yeah so what what is the role of a record label in this digital era do you think it plays a very mm. pivotal role in terms of your music at least well in terms of my music i feel yes um mm-hmm. but in terms of a general rule i think I think it's you know the era of self-releasing records is mm-hmm. it's actually been here for a while you know it's where it's yeah. it's the last you know it's getting easier um but at the end of the day I think the the objective mm-hmm. at least to me is to um present music in such a way that listeners and fans can engage with it and find it and feel connected to it. And as long as someone is doing that to the best of their ability, whether it's with a label or independently, I think they're doing well. You know, I think they're, 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 you know, what, what you wouldn't want is for music to end up uh, on a label and no one hearing it. And you don't want to release it yourself and feel like no one hears it. Um, there's another part to that, which may be an, uh I- implicit in your question but it's it's that um a label can often feel like it it brings a a sense of centeredness mm-hmm. to your business operation you know in other words it feels like well um i like that label and i like these musicians on it and i've never heard of this person but if they're on that label with these musicians they must be good you know there's a certain yeah. sense of uh um kind of built in community and in, in the case of jazz music in the case of the music we play I, i i really cherish that i like i love our colleagues and i love being associated with people who i really respect um because that's how i found so much music myself you know i love this person who played with that person and then i heard about this person so it just plays into the 
kind of way I grew up. Um, having said that, I just think uh, it, there's a million ways to do it. And, it, and it, it really does depend for everybody. In my case, mm-hmm. I, I enjoyed it. Got it. Uh, from whatever you said, I I feel that personally for you, it's the whole concept of community and the fraternity that you are associated with it, which is trying to set a certain benchmark, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Yeah, I, th- I, th- I think it's how we as people work in general, but yeah. it's, it's um, yeah, that to me is inspiring. I'll say Got that. It. Got it. Yeah. You have also studied Indian classical music at mm-hmm. the Ali yeah. Akbar School of Music. That must have given yeah. you quite some grounding in terms of playing the sitar and tabla. I'm going to speak yeah. of Indian classical music traditions. They aren't substantially notarized. Right? So the mood yeah. is sort of verbally described. And I'd like to know from you as to how this mood gets verbally transmitted in its purity mm. from generation to generation, from student mm-hmm. to teacher, when we find that even mm. verbal texts tend to get corrupted. Right? So yeah. what was your approach to learning this particular musical form compared to your approach, uh, say, learning jazz music in general? Uh, it's a really good question. I've never been asked that. Yeah, mm-hmm. I mean, studying, studying sitar and tabla at the Air mm-hmm. School of Music was huge for me. I would have been 13 or 14. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and I mean, where to begin? I, I can't do it justice by, you know, with words. Um, in terms of expressing how meaningful mm-hmm. that experience was. It just was. And I think I was even, in many respects, too young to know why it was so special. But mm-hmm. I think your question underlines a very big part of it, which was the sense that there is tremendous uh, wisdom and intelligence that can be passed from human to human through music. And it's not limited in any way uh, to, to text, you mm-hmm. know, or mm-hmm. things being written down. And, and, uh, uh, and and the, the impression I got because I, I it was only a brief period of study over you know a couple of years of actually playing those instruments it was so clear that the road was infinite <laughs> it wasn't something that I'd learn and go okay I got it see you later you know it's like I'm never going to get this <laughs> uh, completely in one lifetime so uh, as far as that pertains to the music that I've focused the most on you know jazz and improvised music i would say the similarities um are really more centered around the the relationships in other words the reason one of the reasons i loved mm-hmm. um being at the Opera school of music was the people i met and what they would teach me and the teachers i had and then in the world of jazz the teachers i spent the most time with were not people who gave me a lot of texts they were people who played with me you know okay. who i played with who i'd they would take me to their gigs so I could play with them. And, um, or we'd play along to records. Um, and often it was when I was alone in my life that I would study the text. You know, that's when I would, and I think that's the beauty of books and right. videos and all these things where, you know, yeah, you can, you can get an education even if you're alone uh, without guidance from somebody. So looking back, I think what made both of those situations great was that there was a human interaction. Um, and there was an understanding that this music is bigger than us. Uh, and it's not just about memorization. Um, but uh, but I, I, I think about those days of studying Sitar and Tabla there a lot. It was, it was tremendous. Mm-hmm. Have, you, have you developed a taste for any particular Indian uh, musical form? Well, it's funny. I, I, when I was there, I was kind of just a sponge, mm-hmm. you know? Mm-hmm. And I was basically just falling into the music, falling in love with um, Ali Akbar Khan, you know, frankly, and anything he did, even when he was playing, you know, guitar, I was, right. especially was playing guitar record, I was just kind of looking at it as, as a, just as a lover of music. And that, that's, that's continued, you know, mm-hmm. um, we did, I did a recording during the pandemic. I think it just came out uh, with Zakir Hussain mm-hmm. and Charles Lloyd. Right. And, um, we were playing certain ragas that uh, Charles and Zakir play a lot together, and um, and I I felt like that was that brought me back to what I grew up loving, you know, right, uh, right. and uh, and 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 also I mean the truth of the matter is I I'm um, 
I grew up as a fan of all the music that was kind of fusing with Indian music as well. So um, someone like John McLaughlin was huge for me, yeah. right? It's for like for all, for so many of us because I thought, wow, this is <laughs> you know, there's Shakti, but then there's all the things he listened to and all the yeah. things he's referencing, and then for me, Srinivas is the mm-hmm. greatest of all Mandalin time, Srinivas. you know, and someone I. Yeah, yes, exactly. He, to me, that's the, mm-hmm. I don't know. That, that's what I'm trying to be like. <laughs> uh, you know what, you should humility, come down to, you should come down to India, you know, because oh, we've got like, love to. we've got so much diversity, uh, especially for someone like you who loves absorbing all of these different styles of music. I would love to host yeah. you in my country and show you around, you know, different parts. I would be honored. I would yeah. be so honored. You have no idea. My right. wife and I would be there in a heartbeat. Right, right. So in, Let's in figure uh, it out. Right, right. In the southern part of India, we have a very strong uh, culture for Carnatic music. Right, so... Well, I, I can't believe I didn't even say that because, yeah, cause that, that, that was yeah. a huge part of my... Especially my 20s, I was obsessed with right, everything right, Carnatic. Right. So if you happen right. to plan a trip to India sometime in December... Uh, you know, November, December types, we've yeah. got something called the Margari uh, season. So the Margari season is where they play, uh, you know, where all, where a collective of music, Carnatic musicians come down to parts wow. of Chennai, etc. And they have like this yeah. wonderful show that they put together. And it's, it's kind of like planned over like a week or more based on, uh, wow. yeah, different stuff that they want to That sounds incredible. Showcase. Yeah. Yeah. Oh my God. Okay, let's do it. Let's yeah. do it, man. Please, please do come down, and I'd be happy to host you because I live in the southern part of India, and uh, okay. yeah, yeah. So I live in a place called Coimbatore, which is known for Sadhguru's Isha Yoga Center. I don't know if you've heard of him. Oh yeah, of course yeah, I've heard yeah. of that. Yeah, yeah. So that's ah, based that's out that is. based out of uh, Coimbatore. Very close to Chennai and other uh, parts. So Chennai is where the Carnatic music uh, circuit essentially happens. Right. Yeah. And we can also explore That's other so parts. Cool. We can also explore like up north. And then there's a hardcore Sufi music scene that you might be interested in. Wow. I would love, I have a friend who's yeah. very into that. I would love to learn more. Love right. to learn more. Right. right. How cool. <laughs> wow. That sounds amazing. Well, I look forward to doing that. Let's let's yeah. let's keep in close touch. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So speaking of Western classical music, notes and rhythms are kind of the same every time you play them. Uh, what are the things that you rely on most as as far as what you bring to the table? Uh, is say bringing your personality into something as classic as a Beethoven piece, or maybe even a solo tune which is written by you? Uh, so how do you sort of bring more of you today to a classical piece, a Western classical piece? Well, to be honest, I mean, I, that's, that's, that's the question I have, mm-hmm. <laughs> for, especially for those who play more classical music. And, mm-hmm. um, but, but in general, the, 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 the tradition I come from mm-hmm. you usually talked about, you know, you can't help but bring yourself to a piece. I don't. I, I think there's a notion that we have to infuse music with our personality, and I, I think uh, I understand it. I completely understand it. At the same time, I feel like uh, the subtleties in your the timing of a melody or the space you leave or all these things are indications of your, your breath and your body and who you are that can't really be uh, replicated. You know, they're, they're, whether you like it or not is a different thing. Mm-hmm. that's the thing often we want to bring the part of ourselves that's most appealing to the music but to say that we're not infusing the music with our personality to me is often inaccurate mm-hmm. um, um so as far as the question of how do we bring it to i, I think uh uh it's somewhat counterintuitive but i think the deeper we understand the music the more uh respect we have for the movement of the phrasing the more respect we have for the tone we want to produce mm-hmm. uh the more uh, those idiosyncrasies of our personality come through, but it starts with love and respect for the music. Right. Um, it's not something that you need to shove into the song or overlay it. Uh, oftentimes when I've tried to put my personality on a song, I, I kind of clobber what's good about the song. 
Um, so uh, it, there's def- I think step one is 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 just surrendering to that, mm-hmm. um, and maybe step two is trusting that you're going to hear yourself. You know, that's how I feel with Bill Frizzell or I feel with Jim Hall or all my heroes is that they they weren't uh, working hard to be themselves. They couldn't right. not they couldn't play you know an open G chord without it sounding exactly like their hands on those strings. <laughs> and, uh, for me, that's very comforting. Let's touch upon the new release, uh, View with the Room, which yeah. has been groundbreaking, uh, which, is, which has got like a very gorgeous, exploratory and blissful uh, moments in terms of, uh, you know, the vibrant colors. And there, are, there is a lot of, uh, a great deal of exquisite interplay that involves with two of modern jazz's most distinctive voices who are highly skilled and there are very inventive rhythm sections on this one. So could you speak yeah. about this album and what was it like working with the legendary Bill Frizzell? It was, it was amazing. Thank mm-hmm. you for all the kind things you said. Uh, mm-hmm. uh, Bill's amazing. He's, he's the, one of the most genuine and authentic creative forces in the mm-hmm. world, you know, and uh, we're lucky to have worked together quite a bit. Uh, mm-hmm. A lot of music of John Zorn. We've made, I think, oh, wow. five or six records together mm-hmm. with John Zorn and Guion Riley. Uh, also working together in Charles Lloyd's band, we've done Lovely. gigs together like that, and we've done our own duo tours as well. And mm-hmm. and uh, most recently, we were doing a Bob Dylan tribute concert with myself and Bill and Margaret Glassby, my wife, who's also the producer yeah. of you in the yeah. room. So, in other words, Bill is a part of. Uh, we share an ecosystem, mm-hmm. and for him to be incorporated in this record was quite uh, natural, uh, because. The starting point is the trio with Dave King and Jorge Roder, uh, which is the band that I've been lucky enough to play with for quite some time. And, right. you know, it has it's a band that has its own uh, uh, identity, you know, as far as language and vocabulary, uh, an identity that's a work in progress, I should say. So Bill being Bill and his, his just being kind of a, a, a total natural at collaborating. Mm-hmm. Um, he was able to come into a very intimate band, expand it, but without taking away what was good about it. Um, and he did so by using various guitars, various sounds, loops, atmospheric things, just a whole breadth of things right. um, that frankly allowed me to stay the same. I play yeah. the same guitar, same tone. Um, and he so beautifully contextualizes each track based on um kind of what he felt it needed so it, it was it was a, a stunning master class in how to change the music mm-hmm. while still retaining what i uh, felt uh sincere and good about it um it, it was it, I, it, it blew my mind <laughs> it's so incredible to even see something like this happen you know to witness something yeah. like this in this uh era it's just uh, i think i'm lucky you have uh, yeah. listened to this wonderful record. <laughs> Thank you. You're very kind. You embody so many facets of creative expression. What is this creative impulse for you? Is it the use of the word conversation or, or, or is it uh, catharsis? Or is it the need mm. to understand and give it a certain form, sequence and structure? What is this impulse for you? Wow, that's a great question. Um, I, you know, what drops in, um, mm-hmm. it's, I, I don't, I wouldn't say that I have the impulse to make sense of anything. Mm-hmm. I, I, I have no idea what's going on <laughs> in, in, in any respect. Uh, I do think there's a sense of celebration though. Mm-hmm. I think there's a sense of, um, can you believe this is so special and mm-hmm. wanting to have a generous spirit around it? Um, yeah. Yeah. Perhaps that's how I experienced music growing up. Was mm-hmm. I mean, I feel that way about the blues, you know, right, right. and music from African American traditions that I, mm-hmm. feel, you know, I'm so lucky to have grown up just being in love with is mm-hmm. uh, 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 incredible generosity. You know, I think of BB yeah. King, and I think, wow, this is this is just an offering. It's it, and, and that music comes from or is connected, I should say, in so many ways to gospel music and the church, right? And 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 um. Th- that is the impulse to kind of live in that zone. Um, right. 
I just want to be around it. Mm -hmm. uh, and it seems as though if I write music for a band, um, it elicits uh, opportunities for us to tr try to get closer to that space. Mm -hmm. um, I remember Chick Corea talking about composition as um, creating opportunities. You write so that there's an excuse for people to be together. And, um, and it's kind of like throwing a party, you know. Um, and then within the party, anything can happen, hopefully, or, or it depends, I guess, on what kind of music, what kind of party you're throwing. <laughs> but, uh, but that's the impulse is just to, to, to um, yeah, reinforce those spaces so that you can just, you know, go there, access it as much as possible. Music has many elements and you have eloquently articulated technical virtuosity. With all of the sensibilities of music that you have from playing around with aspects like form and structure that you mentioned of, mm -hmm. talking mm -hmm. about a musical form like jazz, how different is it from going to a music school and learning it on your own and being self-taught? Right. Is it only the question of someone looking over your shoulder and to say, well, mm -hmm. this is how it should be played and you're not doing it right? Or is there <laughs> right. a lot more to it than just that yeah well no but that's part of it that's part of it mm -hmm. you know music schools i went to music college and i've taught at these schools for so so long mm -hmm. um and and what my experience is as a both as a student as a teacher is that uh no two people have the same experience right you know uh it's personal because of the agenda that the student brings to the the, the the course to the college um uh i for example i remember having an agenda in college where i was playing previously with so many people and studying and you know even though i was a student of so many people i i, I felt self-taught too because you take what you learn and then you got to go do something with it and sure. uh no one can really do it for you so you got to do it yourself uh and so by the time i got to berkeley school music or college of music my agenda was to um, play with people who play different kinds of music, you know, mm -hmm. and to study classical piano and to study uh, counterpoint, study things that I just knew I didn't know, you know. Um, and, I, and it was very orienting because if the if the objective is find things you don't understand and learn them, then mm -hmm. it's endless, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, but as someone, I, I, I did have colleagues who you know maybe felt like the point of music school was more about um validation you know or someone saying no that, that's not the right thing what you should be doing is this and mm -hmm. and um it's a whole different path uh mm -hmm. I, I think the most important takeaway though for me is that we at some point we are always self-taught you know um and i think sometimes in it do, that doesn't start until later. Sometimes it's what we start with. Um, but but I definitely am a believer that education is there to supplement what we're not getting ourselves. Right. But it's not to replace what we're getting ourselves. Um, I think at the end of the day, it's important that, you know, I remember that it's, you know, I'm going to be at, I've been at every Julian Lodge show, rehearsal. I've been at all of them. <laughs> I'm the guy who's there, whether they're good or not. And so I, I want to take care of that person and I want to support that person with as much um, whatever knowledge, experience as possible. Right. Um, and and that, that, that makes it feel, helps me weather the storm of um, education, frankly. So one can take a lot of routes and by routes to get where they have to, right? From whatever you say. I, I think that's it. I think that's, I mean, I, I, th I think another way of saying that for mm -hmm. me is um it's important to confront education that you disagree with mm -hmm. um sometimes so that you can understand why you know why is that not it for you and if that's not it for you then what does that mean about what is there for you you know it's so it's 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 i think sometimes there's a notion that education is all about opening doors and growth and go and uh, going upward and i think yeah. of often it, it, there's far more resistance involved um but it's it can be wonderful it's just making sure that you're in a situation that doesn't abuse the resistance 
Right. Um, in other words, it's it's uh, um, you know you mentioned a very interesting perspective of someone kind of looking over your shoulder and saying, "No, not quite that." This, and I, I feel um, I've had those experiences, and they're wonderful. Mm-hmm. And often, uh, there's another part to it, which is that uh, you know we're musicians, so we listen and we hear things. It's it's the second part of it is um, when you listen to the music, don't just listen to this, but listen to how they're doing that. So in other words, it's it's a training of how to perceive the whole thing, not just how to do it. Mm-hmm. Um, you say, well, you listen to Elvin Jones and you say, oh, well, he must be on this record. He must be playing really hard. And then someone who knew him or recorded with him says, you know, he actually wasn't playing that hard. It's just that the mics are turned up loud. And you go, oh, OK. You know, so yeah. that that's part of the beauty of uh, education is people showing us how to listen and, and perceive. Mm-hmm. During a performance, I'm sure there are moments of fear. If one way to take a spiritual process of pre-performance rituals, uh, when mm. you've started this process, you don't necessarily have a script which can hold someone else responsible if you mess up, right? Mm. So be it be it good, mm. bad, or indifferent. What if something doesn't work out for you in your favor? How do you handle that? A great question too. Um, well. implicit in your question i think there's something really interesting mm-hmm. um which is uh the notion that we have preconceptions mm-hmm. um the, the only way for something to not go in my favor is if i thought it was supposed to go in my favor you know there's a yeah. certain degree of um expectation that's founded maybe in experience but maybe not in reality so uh for me and and this is just i say with humility because it's a work in progress but For me, it's very important to let go of the expectations. If something goes in a way that I think is not out of my favor, um, I I do my best to ask why did I think it was supposed to be in my favor? You know. Um, now I'm talking about playing music with people I trust. You know who um, have, share a goal. You know, but I, I, as far as So we're we're more we want each other to to succeed and feel supported at all costs. That's the that's the bottom line. Now, if I find myself in a situation that is not like that, where maybe these musicians or this situation isn't in my isn't comfortable, or I don't like the behavior, or I have to play louder than I want, or I have they're telling me to play you know differently than I'm capable or willing to do. Um, similarly. Um, I try to relinquish any sense of this should be different, um, kind of from a survival point of view, and say, "Look, maybe this isn't working. You know, maybe this is the last time we play this song, <laughs> or maybe we don't use yeah. that guitar, maybe we don't play the gig." Uh, uh, so uh, again, it's 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 less about rebounding and more about staying inquisitive. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and at the end of the day, it's art. You know, it's elective. it's yeah. it's something that um we're very privileged to do um mm-hmm. and i think from that point of view it's 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 it it's not supposed to go any way it's just you know it's kind of a miracle that it happens at all and i try to stay close to that way of thinking mm-hmm. in this entire process of making music and catharsis what is it that keeps a musician in you going is there a certain goal Uh, is there a certain point uh, reached when the catharsis is complete? What is it that mm. keeps you going, and is there a destination or is it just the journey? There is some stake of completeness for sure. Do you have one? Yeah. Wow, it's a really great question. I don't know. I mean, <laughs> I really don't know. I, I would be lying if I said mm-hmm. that it's about one thing or another mm-hmm. that keeps it going. Um, mm-hmm. I think there's, you know. I believe in the there being an a certain intelligence mm-hmm. uh to the universe that animates. You know what I mean? There's a sense of yeah. uh, uh it's far deeper than I can fathom. Mm-hmm. So, um as far as the impulse to keep going, I I I think a simpler answer uh or an addendum to I don't know <laughs> is <laughs> is curiosity and, and 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 uh love. You know, I love music and I love art and I and I and the beneficiary of 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 music and art you know what i mean i feel like mm-hmm. a a better person or a happier person because of it so um 
I'm fascinated by it. And, and, and within that, I think, you know, um, there's just so many layers to it. I, I think you said, you talk about catharsis, and I think that's a brilliant word for it. Mm-hmm. Because I, I think implicit in that is, uh, you know, a sense of release. And, and when there's a sense of release, that makes room for something to come in. And then we release that just like an inhalation and an exhalation. So uh, in a way, it's kind of, to me, there's a sense of uh, there being a mechanism at play that puts out music, receives music, puts out music, receives music um, that I, I witness um, mm-hmm. as a fan, you mm-hmm. know, even as a fan, I see it with people. But as a, uh, so I, I guess I, I just, I just really firmly have no idea how the whole thing works. And I love that there's mystery to it. I love it. <laughs> incredible in this yeah. aspiration of the remaining stint in your career uh, of course there have been moments of creative bliss is that what that drives you and would you like to maximize the number of moments of creative bliss as they expand the more complete your life might be and you would have fulfilled your life's purpose as a musician what do you think mm. about this perspective Uh, it's a wonderful perspective. I appreciate that mm-hmm. um, question greatly. I, you know, the creative bliss part of it, it, you know, that's, that's, yeah, that's what's not to like, you know, that's pretty wonderful. Yeah. Um, I, I would say as of now, at least my, I'm, I'm fascinated by mm-hmm. uh, equally, I should say, I'm fascinated equally by ways to accept when it's not blissful, mm-hmm. you know, Um, I don't mean settling for it, right. but, but saying that uh, I think, you know, maybe put overly simply, but, you know, I think our, the job is to end suffering in any way you can, you know, what, even if that means, especially if for yourself mm-hmm. um, before we're gone, you know, it's like, how do you, uh, and, and suffering and pain are different. I don't mean to have no pain, but I mean to not suffer unnecessarily over the challenges of, of life um, or to use them as an opportunity to wake up, you know, to be present, to be um, available spiritually, mm-hmm. you know, and creatively. So um, though seeking the blissful moments are great, I think it is, how do you make friends with the challenges? Um, you know, how can I not beat myself up? How can I have a loving relationship on this path? No, regardless of how it's going, you know, to me, there's, Um, a certain transcendence there um, and there's a certain peace um, and, and, and to be involved in that from that perspective to me is is huge and I, I, I you know I feel like that's that's more than enough to, to, to work on um, making friends with the whole picture mm-hmm. rather than chasing one particular experience is kind of uh, where my interest lies right now very interesting take towards this entire process and life in general. We, we've, we've sort of moving to the last part of our agenda, which is yeah. uh, the rapid fire round. And I'll, okay. be, I'll be giving you some very interesting questions where you don't have to think so much. You can be spontaneous okay, with your answers, right? Great. The first Great. question for you. What are some of the artists that you have discovered lately and probably the top five on your playlist right now? Wow, top five of the playlist. It, it tends to be the same people, I confess. <laughs> uh, but it's it's a lot of Sonny Rollins. It's Charlie Christian. Uh, it's um, Wilco. I love. Mm-hmm. I, there's so many songs of theirs that I love. Mm-hmm. Um, um, I'm trying to remember. What I was listening to what well, Coltrane. Just okay. Coltrane plays the blues. That's always there. Right. Solo Monk. Solo Funny Monk. It tends to be you know musicians that I've listened to my whole life. Got it. Um, And as far as new artists, there's a, so many great ones, but not enough. I'm not intimate enough with it, with them uh, to say that I listen to them all the time. Got it. Could you tell people about your collaboration with Guitar Study and the courses you have to offer? And how can someone from India learn from you? Oh, well, yeah, absolutely. I, at the moment, I, I, I'm not teaching a lot of these courses online, mostly because I'm on tour. But mm-hmm. during the pandemic, we hosted what we called town halls, which were... Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, 90 minute classes online where you could have hundreds of participants 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was amazing. And people would come up and play uh, and be a part of it. The best place to check is our website as we start to introduce. We're plotting for new online education, but it'll be a little bit. Uh, in the meantime, we have a website called guitar.study. That's mm-hmm. kind of the home of it. And um, also our website of julianlash.com will reference all of these projects. But um, but yeah, that's the place to check in. Got it. What are some of the causes that you might want to contribute apart from music? You said causes, right? Uh-huh. Uh, well, you know, to me, this music in many respects is a form of social activism, you know? And so it'd be, you know, um, God, there's, there's, there is systemic problems, systemic racism, systemic inequality. Um, uh, there's systemic issues that permeate everything. So, um, I wouldn't say that what we're doing is the same as being, you know, it's, it's not a direct correlation that, you know, if you play music, you don't have to address these issues. But it's to say that as a musician, I feel lucky to meet very intelligent people who do address these issues, um, either through various means. Um, and I seek to be a part of that conversation and being able to contribute. Mm-hmm. Um, now, the path to that is not obvious to me always, um, but there are, especially through the through education, through the um, the programs I teach, um, through the programs we're starting to build of our own. Mm-hmm. Um, there's just there's there's a point of view that is you know more inclusive trying to break down um a lot of assumptions that are made as far as um people and who's allowed and all these things and um i just i i want the work we do to address these problems in any way we can and then there's a lot for me to learn about it lovely what is that one song that always makes you cry yeah cry you uh I would say fire the last movement of Firebird Sweet by Stravinsky. Oh. That one always makes me teary cuz I just it's so good. It's so good. On the contrary, what's your favorite guilty pleasure song? Oh, guilty. I don't really have too much <laughs> guilt around any of it. So <laughs> okay. uh uh so yeah, I can't think of one that's obvious. Got it. So I have one last question for you which yeah. is a custom in all of my interviews and I ask all of my distinguished guests this very question. So Julian, mm. down in the distant horizon, what would you want to be remembered as? Oh wow. Grateful. Just grateful. Very grateful. <laughs> I mean, it's hard to say one thing, but I think so I I feel like um I've been a beneficiary of such kindness, you know. Mm. Mm-hmm. It's such great teaching and um mm-hmm. and friendship too i i i um and I feel tremendous gratitude and curiosity uh-huh. um um and and i think grat- sometimes we think of gratitude as being not generous, but I think from gratitude you have generosity i think from gratitude you have compassion Correct. and from gratitude you have empathy so um my hope is that that's in there somewhere wonderful wonderful. So this this particular interview will additionally be aired on Big FM Shillong and Azol on the Sunday primetime show between 5 to 6 and I'll be sure to send you the posters when when it does Please. air. Please. Yeah, yeah. And I'll also send you an I'm ad so check. I'm so honored. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Show yeah. me show send me anything. Yeah. Um yeah. you you're wonderful. You what a, that was one of the best interviews I've ever done. Thank you for taking the time to do it. That means a lot coming from you. Uh I mean, really, really truly truly honored and privileged to have had this opportunity to to talk to uh, one of modern jazz best uh, artists so it's just it's been a, an, an incredible privilege <laughs>